everybody and thank you for coming and welcome to everybody that's joining us online. Um, we've got lots of people signed up online, including um, we think a group of youth work students in Sunderland. So welcome Sunderland. <laughs> Okay, so before I introduce Tanya, we thought we'd just go round and say who we are and where we come from. Um, <laughs> so I'm Carolyn Jackson, I'm from the Department of Educational Research. I'm really pleased that Tanya's here because she's speaking for the Centre for Social Justice and Wellbeing in Education, which I'm currently co-director of, soon to be taken over uh, by Sue, so that's good. Um, so, I'm Jill Armstrong. I'm Chris Marlowe, PhD student, Education Research. I'm Sunil Banga, I'm a teaching fellow in the Management School in Management Science and a PhD student here in Education Research. Gemma Derrick, Education Research. My name is Heike, I used to be a youth worker in Sunderland, so if you are there, hello. <laughs> and, uh, that's it. <laughs> Uh, I'm Lucy Maynard, I work for Radio Trust, we're a youth charity based in Amberside, but we have um, community hubs across the world. Uh, I'm Tracy Carl, I work in the community of the University of Sydney. I'm Sue Grandma from Education Research. Rebecca Martin from Education Research. I'm Bruce Hampton from Education Research. I'm Claire from the Centre <coughs> Good to see you back. Good to be back. <laughs> okay, so, so welcome. And um, we've had a slide up earlier saying that if any of our online participants want to email questions, we really welcome them. So you can email edwesseminars at lancaster.ac.uk. Um, so please do that. So, Tanya, welcome. Um, Thank you. It's, it's really exciting that you've come to speak to us. And I'd like to flag. <laughs> I know that you'll be speaking in part from the work that you've done in this book and also from the yeah. ESRC project that you're just starting. Yeah. I would wholly recommend this book. If you've not seen it already or read it, I would suggest you buy it and read it. I <laughs> I've really enjoyed it and um, I don't most of my work's conducted in formal education, but there's so much in here that actually is relevant to formal education context as well, the stuff about neoliberalism, target driven agendas, you know, performativity, all those kinds of things. And what I particularly enjoyed the chapter you wrote about um, authenticity and shame. So I would really flag this as a, as a good read. And Thank you. you. So I do have one copy with me at an author discount if anyone. <laughs> it's all 15 quid. I was trying to, you know, it's hard with publishers. We're trying to um, persuade them to, it's hard enough to persuade them to publish anything in paperback these days. Yeah, but, um, it's, so it's still a bit overly expensive, but, you know, you can get a discount on it if you go to their website. There's a way of getting a discount. I'd say it's well worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so, obviously, so you'll speak for about 45 minutes and then we've got time. Yeah, and I might if yeah I might stop in the middle for some in betweeny questions. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the lovely welcome, and it's really amazing to have people from so many different parts of uh, Lancaster <laughs> University um, Department, but beyond the Education Department, and people here from the youth work world, and probably people who are thinking, what's this youth work world? <laughs> so, um, yeah, welcome, and it's um, exciting to be live streamed. I don't think I've been live streamed before, um, so yeah, amazing, anyone who's listening online, and uh, especially the group in Sunderland, that's great, and um, please do email your questions. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm a lecturer at the moment in King's College London, and my um, teaching is not really about youth work, it's about education policy and international child studies, sociology of youth and childhood. Um, and then my um, research is about youth work, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Before I got into the academic uh, world, I was a youth worker since I was a young person myself, since sort of 25 years ago or something, when I started doing voluntary play work and youth work. 
Um, so I really come from that practice background and still feel quite rooted in the practice background. Um, so, um, yeah, the presentation today is called Valuing and Evaluating Grassroots Youth Work in a Changing Policy Context. And what I plan to do today is bring together elements from two studies. And the first study was my PhD. It was the basis of this book, Grassroots Youth Work. Um, and then I'll mention more briefly my new study, which is about youth impact and evaluation. So the valuing and evaluating seem to pull these two things together. Um, and so I'm going to be discussing the kind of context that youth work is um, existing or trying to exist in at the moment, uh, particularly in terms of the cuts, um, but also the, the wider and longer term neoliberal policy context. Um, I want to give a bit of a flavour from the research grassroots youth workers' perspectives on this situation, on their own work. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about targets, measurement and impact and finish with some sort of thoughts that I'd love to discuss with you and hear your thoughts on in terms of grassroots accountability or, or what can be done, how can we evaluate work in a way that is valuing of that work rather than kind of undermining of it in some way. Um, so my, my argument really is that youth work is in a very vulnerable situation at the moment and it's particularly important to value this special practice. But I do know that some of you are not youth workers and probably don't know what that is. So before going further, I do want to mention, kind of both clarify what youth work means, but also give a particular account of what youth work means to me. Um, so in England, there's a rich tradition of youth work as a distinctive practice. And youth work is also completely international. The reason I mention England is that it, uh, in every place youth work exists, it has its own nuances, it has slightly different um, norms. Um, and even, even within England, what youth work is is actually quite contested. So um, I would suggest that youth work... Uh, as a distinctive practice involves these three elements. It is um, a tradition of informal education. And what do I mean by informal education? Well, education that involves learning through conversation, through activity, through relationship. And what youth workers do, I mean, we could do that anyway. We, we learn anyway through our experiences, through what we talk with others about, through our social relations with others, through being in the world. But what youth workers do is create spaces deliberately to bring that learning about. The second element is that you, young people are involved on a voluntary basis. They can leave when they choose. Um, and there might be youth workers working in settings such as schools or prisons where young people cannot leave, actually. But the, the kind of main practice of youth work that I'm talking about today is not so much that. It's more... Um, open spaces where young people are able to come and go when they want to. They're there on a voluntary basis. And that really does distinguish it from most of the other spaces that young people are part of. And the third element, uh, it being young person-centred, youth-centred. So um, I need to mention this grassroots word. I didn't start my initial PhD research with the word grassroots in mind. And I'm by no means claiming that there's a particular sort of type of youth work that is called grassroots youth work that's separate from other youth work. I use that word more to kind of evoke a particular approach to youth work. And, you know, of course, we could have grassroots practices of all sorts of things. For me, it's a useful word because it emphasises bottom-up democratic values. It emphasises a concern for local, main, often marginalised groups, so the local, the small, um, youth work that's primarily informal, that's rooted in neighbourhoods or other types of community. I know community is a problematic word, but for example, youth work that takes place online where people come together, young people come together to discuss with each other around perhaps shared interests, shared challenges or shared identities. Um, and for me, this grassroots youth work, it relates to the European term open youth work. Open youth work, it takes place in places like youth clubs, community spaces, on the streets, in the parks. And the point about open youth work is 
it's open to young people who choose to come. You don't have to be referred there by a professional. Um, but it's also open in its approach. It hasn't already decided or tied down what the outcomes might be, what the point of this might be. And that leaves it more open to young people to discover for themselves, to create for themselves with their workers what this space might do for them. So it's kind of in some ways more risky, certainly more informal um, than some other approaches to work with young people. So um, the background to both of the studies I'll talk about today um, is a really challenging policy context really. And youth work is a, a service or a practice that has been devastated over the last 10 years, um, and I don't use that word lightly, but there really have been hugely damaging cuts in many areas of the world, but really, again, much more in England than, for example, in Scotland, Wales, um, uh, and other countries. So the figures don't really show enough of how drastic these cuts have been, because we have figures for spending on youth services, but they can cover a wide range of practices. So there's been around one third cut in local authority spending on youth services just in the years 2014 to 17, just within three financial years. A third was cut, and you'll notice that 2014 is several years after the beginning of the financial crisis. So you can imagine there were uh, huge cuts before that. Between 2011 and 16 in London boroughs, there were up to 80% cuts to youth services. It was, again, on average a third, but up to 80% um, in one borough, um, over 50%, I think, in 11 boroughs in London. And they were just the ones that answered the Freedom of Information request. But what's really happened is that open forms of youth work, or grassroots forms of youth work, they've been disproportionately affected. Um, and this is across the voluntary sector and local authority youth work. It partly comes from local authority funding, which was once granted and then sometimes commissioned to local voluntary sector organisations. And these local authorities have had their funding cut from government, as we all know, so they really are having to make difficult decisions. And at the same time, the ring fence the ring fencing around youth services was removed as it was for everything and this meant that local authorities understandably really have to just do kind of the basics. Um, and open youth work, it can be seen as something that's a bit hard to understand, a bit unnecessary perhaps, um, and I'll go on to argue I think it is necessary but it is of course, you know, it's, it's understandable that it's very difficult to fund it at the moment. What that's led to though is not just a lack of youth work. You know, we have ebbs and flows in finances, don't we, on spending on everything. Things go back and forth. And throughout youth work's history, it's been, there's been times of more spending and times of less. But really what's happened over the last, since 2010 in particular, is that there has been an irreversible damage, a loss of infrastructure, of experience. So infrastructure, I mean things like youth clubs being sold off, and we know the price of land and buildings now. It's very unlikely that those are going to be brought back into public or community ownership. Things like university courses for youth workers are being closed down at a rate of knots, like really many of them are vulnerable, many of them have already closed. And University courses can start back up, but to lose that experience of those people who've been lecturing on those courses over a long time, the experience of really experienced, passionate youth workers who've been involved a long time, who've maybe been the managers or maybe they've been very committed um, grassroots youth workers who bring so much, who've been, you know, I had the pleasure when I started as a 17 year old of working alongside people who've been doing youth work for 20, 30, 40 years. When we make these people redundant or we encourage them to retire early, we're losing so much that's going to be very difficult to bring back. And now people tell me when they advertise youth work jobs, people don't go for them because I think people have lost heart or faith or, you know, a lot of the jobs are also really precarious. So there are, you know, the people who do have jobs in youth work, often they're very short term. Sometimes they're on zero hour contracts or self-employed forms of work. Um, and the same for organisations, you know, very short term funding. 
Um, but when I started planning my first study, the cuts hadn't really kicked in. Um, I was planning it probably around 2010 and started, in, started data collection in 2011. And the cuts weren't by then the main challenge facing youth work. And I started wanting to do research because I was working as a youth worker and I was really frustrated and angry at times, upset at other times, demoralized at times by the context in which I worked. Um, and as I sort of studied and read around it, you know, of course, came across the big N-word, neoliberalism, um, uh, by which I know it's a, you know, overused term, but um, what I mean by that is the global dominance of big business, the privatization of the public and the voluntary in the community, and also the privatization of everyday life of our, of our lives, and, and it sort of seeps into our everyday practices, even if we might disagree with it. Um, it is a complex term, we'll come back to it, but what I'm arguing is that neoliberal policies were embedded during the new Labour government, even at times of higher spending. So marketisation through increased um, private sector practices, through commissioning and contracts rather than grants. And the difference there is, you know, it sounds a bit technical, but grants were um, local community organisations doing needs analyses, bottom up, thinking, what's needed? We're going to ask for that money. And commissioning can be done like that, but tends to be done in a top-down sort of, um, a top-down way where uh, decisions are made higher up. Securitization, the surveillance, um, growing use of youth workers as kind of soft police, and um, the increase in kind of asking youth workers to embed traditional values and conservative values. So today I'm going to talk mainly about kind of target cultures and a bit about marketisation, but th these things are all related, the marketisation, the managerialism and the security, securitisation. So for my um, study, the research um, question, the overall research question was how do part-time youth workers experience their role in a changing policy context and it was based in England while well, trying to learn from other contexts as well and it was based in England because that's where I knew and where I was but also because policy is made, is, um, youth policy is different in the different um, nations of the UK and also because the policy change in England is, was, being, was particularly stark and intense, so it was sort of an interesting place to look at what was happening. By part-time youth workers, I mean volunteers as well as paid part-time youth workers. It's a bit of an anomaly in youth work that historically part-timers includes part-time volunteers. Most part-time workers, um, it's not just sort of a choice of, you know, how you work. It's usually um, the part-time work is usually the work that's lowest on the hierarchy, that's mainly working face to face with young people, often volunteers or employed in an insecure condition. So people do work part time as, as managers as well and senior workers, but the, the vast majority of youth workers are part time and are face to face workers on the lowest wages. Disproportionately they're women, they're working class, they're black and from other minoritized communities. They're often local, they often share experiences um, and backgrounds with the young people they work with and many start as young people as I did myself. Um, most, I think about um, more than half of the youth workers I interviewed started as young people and several of them were still working in their own communities. And there hasn't been much research sort of looking at part-time youth workers in particular um, and often because they're not the managers, they're not the people to be asked what is your opinion so they don't really tend to get listened to in policy discussions. So I thought it was really important, you know, and partly um, through a concern for workplace democracy, um, people who have the less power, what do they actually think about their work and, and valuing that rather than sort of assuming they don't really know much about it. Many of them are very experienced and have been doing it a long time. So my methodology for this study was, uh, it was a qualitative study, um, took place over three years, 2011 to 13. It was, approach, it was an approach generally informed by activist scholarship by which I mean that I had no pretense of being a neutral observer, um, but rather I was acting in, in solidarity with um, sort of political campaigns around youth work, both against the cuts, but also a group that I'm involved in, in defence of youth work, which challenges much of the kind of, uh, of the neoliberal elements to youth work that I've been talking about. Um, there were 35 people taking part in interview, in-depth interviews and focus groups, all part-time or volunteer youth workers. Um, and I also um, 
carried on working mainly voluntary or sometimes paid part-time as a youth worker throughout the study and drew on that experience as well through participant observation. So sort of briefly, what, what did these part-time and volunteer youth workers say? What came up? Um, and I was expecting through my own experience and through my um, speaking, knowing lots of part-time youth workers, that people would be kind of critical of various things that were changing in their work. Um, but what was really overwhelming was that the workers absolutely loved their work. They were passionately committed to their work. I mean, these were people who chose to take part in a study about youth work, so maybe, you know, we might expect mainly people who quite liked it. We might expect some who wanted a good moan as well, I don't know. Um, but, you know, these workers were absolutely passionate about their work. Um, and this was striking, and I felt like, you know, this really needs to be encompassed in the study. I can't tell a tale of grassroots youth work that's just about... Um, you know, the target cultures and so on. My questions, my interview questions were quite open, so I didn't ask, you know, what do you think about target cultures, you know, or something like that. I just asked, how did you become a youth worker? What do you like about your work? What don't you like? It was that kind of thing. Um, so the like we'll come back to in a minute. The don't like was nearly always targets, paperwork, bureaucracy, being told you're not allowed to work with someone because they, you know, live in the wrong boundary or they're just suddenly the wrong age group and you're never allowed to speak to them again. Sort of inflexibility, both of management and of funding. They really passionately wanted to be involved in decisions made about their work. And some of them were, but for many, for most, this didn't happen very often. And they also really valued working alongside those experienced, supportive colleagues. Some of them were lucky too, but those colleagues, those managers, were really put in the office a lot of the time and they didn't get much access to them. Um, and others worked alongside um, managers who they felt had no experience of youth work and no understanding of their work. So to share a couple of quotations, um, a volunteer, Nevea, they chose their own sort of pseudonyms. Um, I asked her, what do you like about youth work? She said, I love it. I literally spend the evening going from group to group chatting to people, anything they want to talk about. I think the face-to-face -face time is what keeps you real. It's what keeps you wanting to do it. And this was a very typical quote that when I asked, what do you like, the word love nearly always came back to me. Nearly every person said, I love it. They used the word passion a lot. They sort of looked, you know, passionate when they were talking about it. And the keeping it real, that came up a lot, the kind of authenticity. And I know we need to kind of problematise these things, but I also think we just need to celebrate them. You know, it's really good. That's a nice thing that people can love what they do, uh, love spending time with young people, talked about genuine care for young people and so on. But of course, this does bring particular problems in any context, but particularly in the current, um, in the policy context at that time, that's sort of got even worse now, probably, where people were employed on really bad contracts. I mean, Nevea was a volunteer, but uh, Mahathir, for example, he did a few hours. He had several different jobs, some of which were youth work, some of which were not. Um, and like other people, he said, well, when you've got passion for something, you don't continuously look at the time or how much you're getting paid. You just get into it. And that's... You know, in some ways, lovely, I, I, I recognise that myself, I do it myself, but when you're actually already getting paid very little and your hours are very small and your service is being cut back, you know, this is really problematic. When you're also very likely to be from a marginalised uh, social group that's already <coughs> paid badly and so on, you know, it's problematic. So, you know, and, and I, I do like the, the sort of slightly old now work on emotional labour which you know I know people have moved on and used different theories and so on but I really I think it's really important and Hoxha Charles was writing in the 80s about how predominantly women's labour is involved and relies upon very sophisticated caring emotional skills that are not paid for that are not valued in the workplace and with these workers I was speaking to you know mainly women, but it wasn't just women, also you know, men from ethnic minorities, men and women from ethnic minorities and so on, really relied on their it's sophisticated emotional skills and this isn't valued in a, in a marketplace really or sufficiently rewarded. So 
in the study, this kind of passion that the youth workers felt for their work really contrasted with what they looked like and talked about when they started talking about, you know, particularly reference to targets and outcomes. And I'm deliberately not going to get into the kind of exact policy of which targets and outcomes they had to fulfil at that time. Most of them have changed a little bit now, and I'll talk a bit about it later. But most of them had to meet specified targets for young people getting into work or young people getting certificates or young people filling in particular kinds of forms and this kind of thing. And again, this is a very representative quote from uh, Mickey, who worked in an LGBT uh, youth group as a part-time worker. And she said, it's not as much my organisation being able to say, yeah, that's really good work, and actually this is quality work. It's a numbers game, and we have to meet what the funders' expectations are. I'm conflicted about it. I always try and make sure my workers, um, young people have ownership of it, and they have options, and they choose things. But sometimes that isn't the case. And I'm aware of that. And again, there's a contrast there, I think, the authenticity versus the kind of the numbers game, you know, that word game, which calls up something that's not very authentic anymore. Um, and yeah, I'm not going to talk about it today, but I did get interested in this area of shame and kind of felt it myself, the, sh the kind of shame and the disconnect of meeting targets that we see as inauthentic, that we see as sometimes really damaging to work with young people. So, um, you know, I'm by no means alone in suggesting, and youth work is by no means the only, the only practice where this happens, that there's a real clash between the informal uh, nature of human relationships and then how they're increasingly measured. And anyone who works in any form of education or social care will recognise this. I'm not saying it's worse in youth work, but I think there is a particularly distinctive challenge here because youth work is so informal, because it's youth-centred, because it, it's traditionally been chosen by young people because it's different from school and social work um, and they choose it and they, they expect to see some informality there and then how it was being measured at that time. And these measurable outcomes um, were clearly linked to the ways in which you know, things were ranked, things were valued. Youth work was valued um, by uh, policy makers in a kind of way that that seemed to echo the school league tables. I mean, there wasn't a national league table of youth work organisations, but um, it, on, in regional and local environments, youth work projects were being directly ranked um, according to how many of these outcomes they'd met. They were being, people were being pulled into the office and told off if they weren't meeting these outcomes. Um, lots of kind of red, amber, green spreadsheet rankings and so on. And of course, for some, this gave an opportunity to sort of, it was a bit tempting as well to feel like you're succeeding. Um, and uh, I, I included this Stephen Ball quote, which I really like, that policy neoliberalizes us, he says, by making us enterprising and responsible, by offering us the opportunity to succeed, and by making us feel guilty if we do not. So while I was feeling guilty for doing these inauthentic things, I'd also feel guilty when I didn't meet the targets, which is ridiculous. I couldn't have opposed them more. I even had a sort of academic and, uh, you know, political language with which to criticise them. And still, if those targets weren't being met, it, it, you know, you felt guilty. And when they were, you felt a bit of satisfaction. Well, you know, it's kind of, and then the shame comes back, because <laughs> why are we feeling like this? Um, so... Yeah, I want to mention kind of some uh, just how I was taking policy and I suppose drew, drawing on a blend of um, neo-Marxist writing alongside some post-structural writing to argue that policy is not just kind of made at government level and then um, implemented in organisations, but rather it's, you know, it's much more chaotic than that. And especially in something like youth work, where policy is sometimes made at a national level, but sometimes at a local level, and also in organisations themselves. It's jumbled, it's messy, it's contested. And that key word, contested. I wanted to... Um, I guess I was interested in resistance, and I was interested in would resistance come out of the data? Would these youth workers be resisting these things they didn't like? Um, again, I didn't ask them, but things did come out. However, it wasn't usually the traditional kind of strikes and trade union organising and street-based organising. It was more kind of everyday resistance. Um, and it, it could be seen as falling under three types, um, what I'd call counter-discourses, refusals and rebellion, and 
treating alternatives. And I'll just give a couple of examples of these from the data. Um, so the first is a part-time youth worker, Laura, and she was asked by her managers to go and speak to the trustees about um, what she was achieving in the youth work and she felt she had to do some of that tangible stuff um, but she wanted to go beyond that so she said I had to show what opportunities we give young people. I had to give a few examples of concrete things we give them, very concrete, tangible things and then I said but the most important things are the things you can't touch and I made a massive emphasis on that because they're so obsessed with bloody targets so then I sort of made from the concrete ones which untangible ones come out of that and then some comments from the young people. So, you know, is it a form of resistance? I mean, in some ways it doesn't matter. I think it's really important that the youth workers were saying that they were challenging these norms. Whether that still happens, you know, I don't know. It's interesting because the, the meeting of targets at that time has kind of developed into something more subtle. Um, but, you know, yes, the youth workers wanted to say, they wanted to explain that account for a kind of practice that wasn't just what was being valued on the pieces of paper and on the spreadsheets. In terms of refusals and rebellion, this was a sort of nearer to over or traditional resistance. And there wasn't loads of that going on, but um, one group in particular where there was a really good example was uh, Mickey, who I mentioned before, who worked for an LGBT um, group that ran a youth group as part of what it did. And um, they had uh, had to do this thing of recording young people's information on a database which would go to the local authority. They were a voluntary sector group and they would have to um, tell the local authority who they were working with and lots of people because it was partly about joined up services as well. Lots of people had access to this database. So they were clearly... Um, for obvious reasons to do with young people's privacy, particularly aware of how damaging this was in terms of surveillance and in terms of young people's privacy to come to a group without being kind of, um, without being outed in this case. Um, and Mickey said, the young people made a campaign and we supported that. I think it's about an ethos and a principle of respecting young people's details and not seeing their information as currency to get funding. The staff and volunteers are not threatened, are not going to be pushed over. Your threatening my job doesn't make my principles or the principles of this place any different. I think it's partly just because of the kind of general vibe of the place. But also there was a lot of support from a lot of people. So she really emphasised the sort of community solidarity um, and the history of that organisation that gave it a few more resources to draw on in terms of overt resistance. And they were successful for themselves in that campaign but the rest of the organisations and the local authority did have to keep recording their work in that way. So for that time, they kept their, their funding um, at the time, although the youth service that funded them is no longer, doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, a lot of these things, uh, they were important struggles at the time and, and things have moved on. And the other thing that was happening quite a lot amongst the people I spoke to was the creating or aiming to create new organisations. Um, in a way that they wanted them to be different. So um, Kieran said, because we see these things all the time, and he'd been telling me both about corrupt practices at one organization he did some freelance work for, and also very kind of managerial, <coughs> large organizations swooping into an area and sort of standardizing everything and paying people badly. We see these things all the time, he said. We see so much bad practice. We want to show that there can be a good organization there that really cares about young people. We're not all about, you know, money and targets like other organizations are. And during the research I myself was involved in a group, Voice of Youth, which um, is still just about um, uh, carrying on. But, you know, for all of us involved in these new groups, some of them have thrived, but for many of us it's been very difficult to survive in the context of very few cuts while also trying to challenge the kind of norms of um, target-driven work and so on. So these forms of everyday resistance are clearly limited, you know, I'm not saying they're revolutionary, but I think it, it is interesting to think that these workers were resisting um, amongst huge pressures and difficulties. Um, I did want to add a couple of quotations from young people. I didn't involve young people in the research, and later on I sort of 
probably with retrospect I'd, I'd have designed it differently but at the time I was really concerned that these part-time and volunteer workers were not being listened to and at the time there were some studies around young people's views of youth work whereas there were none on part-time workers views of youth work um, but uh, some of the workers themselves were of course very young so um, they were reflect these uh, two that I'm going to give examples of they're reflecting on their own involvement in youth work as well as uh, they're now working as peer youth workers. So Keyshawn, who was uh, 20 at the time, I think, um, said, being allowed to choose whether you just want to sit in a corner with your friend on your phone and just sit there, do nothing at all all day, or whether you want to get involved, talk to the workers, start planning. You're allowed to have your own mind. You're not forced to go to one place and have to act like everyone else. Um, and he, um, I think that it's important to sort of I don't know, value or, or think about the value of the choice to just do nothing, that very open work where there's not necessarily got to be a preset outcome and an acceptance that some, some young people are just being there and maybe that's okay. And Anna Nina reflecting was saying it's a free space, it's not like school where you have to go and do set things, it's more relaxed I guess. And there's more of a relationship between the young people and the youth workers. I can't explain it, it's quite spontaneous, like you can kind of drop your worries-ish if that makes sense. Just come here and do something fun, chat with your friends and have a debate. And I quite like in that both the sort of, it's not like school, that distinction, but I like the I can't explain it, the ish, the uncertainty and recognise that from my own attempts even after all these years to say what youth work is. I do start going, oh, it's, it's kind of like this and, it, you know, surely I should be able to explain it clearly by now, it's part of my job, but it's really difficult to explain something that's so uncertain and the uncertainty is at the heart of this practice and while we need to get good at explaining it I think that being good at explaining it needs to value some of the intangibles some of this kind of ish <laughs> um, so I was thinking as I was finishing that study that you know can the dominant policy agenda be challenged and, and one of the blogs I was reading at the time by Nick Axford who's involved in one of the What Work centres um, you know I'd, I'd differ with him on, on what he thinks but it's a really good blog and it's about the he went to speak to youth workers at, at the um, group for youth work lecturers and they were challenging sort of outcomes um, frameworks and so on and he, were, he listed the reasons why, why these youth workers, youth work people, youth work lecturers were challenging the kind of impact culture and so on with some, you know, some understanding and he said fair enough services don't have to produce demonstrable outcomes to be of value but it is hard to see policy makers being terribly convinced by this argument at least in a climate of austerity and youth work has a job on its hands to convince them otherwise Resistance to scrutiny is likely to be perceived as being deliberately difficult and opaque in order to hide woolly thinking and a lack of effectiveness. And I guess this is where I sort of want to talk a little bit about my new study. I won't talk as much about the new study, um, probably just, you know, 15 minutes or something. But would people like to ask questions or mention, you know, you don't need to be questions, mention things on what I've said so far? Shall I keep going? What do you prefer? Questions? Keep going. Don't know. I'm really enjoying it. Oh, <laughs> you're lovely. <laughs> yeah, it's, take, it's taken me back to all of those tensions that we had because, you know, I was in the volunteer sector. I had 50 staff, the local authority, who had to statutory fund youth services mm. and weren't doing so. Yeah. Turned to my organisation to solve that problem. And then started to say, oh, and by the way, we're only going to give you the money if you can get these kids through this many qualifications. Yeah. You're accredited and you're recorded and all those awful outcomes that we used to have to. Mm. You know, and as much as you wanted to encourage your staff to revolt or whatever the words are that you used, I quite like revolt, actually. No, yeah. revolt's better, I think. Yeah. But, you know, as much as you wanted them to do that and you wanted them to love young yeah. people, they admitted that young people were walking through the door and they were thinking, well, I get an accredited outcome out of it. Yeah. And that's a terrible place yeah. to be when the work is all about the relationship, you know, and starting where young people are at, like you say, the grassroots stuff. So yeah. um, this is brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> got a question here. And then we've got two from the online participants. Oh, fantastic. I have a question. I've 
about uh, you mentioned about the loss of the infrastructure. Yeah. Have you done some research related to the infrastructure of the youth worker? As like you said, the mm. youth club has been mm. uh, sold at mm. the like yeah. university. Yeah. 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 So, good question. I haven't done uh, research personally on the infrastructure that's been lost, but some organisations have, including the union. So, both Unison and Unite have come up with figures, which I haven't got, but I bet some of our listeners probably might know these figures. Anyone got them on the top of their head? But you know, they've they've sort of tried to count how many youth centres have been lost. Um, and I don't know if anyone listening from TAG knows how many courses have been shut, but you know we could definitely find that out. Those figures are available. Um, and I do think it's quite difficult to do research on, actually, because but, so even when we look at the, the reports of those who've done that research, it's hard to get accurate figures um, because youth work's always traditionally been a, a grassroots thing. So it's sometimes run by local authorities, sometimes by mostly by the voluntary sector, uh, some of whom might be sort of charities we'd have heard of, but most of them are very small local organisations. Um, and to even decide, well, what counts as a youth club being lost? Does the estate community hall where I was working, where there were two different organisations running youth clubs once a week, and that's not happening anymore, but how do you even measure that? It's quite hard. The figures are massively underrepresented and, can't, and are quite difficult to kind of, um, uh, what's the word, uh, speak about in a comparable way. So the unions will list this many jobs lost, this many spaces lost, this many centres lost, which will be underreported, but also, well, out of how many, you know, <laughs> so you're a bit stuck with it, really. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is Nigel, who's in, up in the Highlands of Scotland. Wow. Um, and he says... Certainly, the debate around measures, etc., are found here. And because of the role I have, a manager, I do see a need for knowing from a distance. And he said, where he is, it takes seven hours to get from one youth worker to another. Yeah. How youth work is making a difference, so I can convey messages to senior managers and other partners. And my main point is that a form mentioned senior managers and partners have to get out spend time with young people and their supporting adults, youth workers at all. They must walk the walk. They must experience the deep frustrations and sadnesses that young people and communities, whatever that means, have. In that way, and speech mark performance information yeah. and KPIs become flesh. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Just completely agree. Um, that's, that's really important and the, certainly the part-time youth workers I spoke to really valued those managers and those funders who visited them, who came out, or who'd done it in the past, but even if they hadn't done that work in the past, maybe they'd done something similar. If they came out and they wanted to understand, um, but increasingly they were saying those managers really found it difficult to do so. Yeah. You can't do everything, you know, the, the time taken filling in all the forms does, does take up a lot of time. Yeah. Did you have another one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Liz and her group from Sunderland. They have two questions. Um, thank you as well, as said. The, the normalisation of neoliberal practices, loss of experienced youth workers, reduction of open youth work. How do we look to create experienced supervisory stroke community of practices yeah. for current part time youth workers to support them to resist policy? And the second question is, your talk has given us a clear pathway of how we have arrived at the current moment. What can you say about our way out of this? Yeah. <laughs> Great. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I just realised I'm taking my necklace off because I could hear it banging against the microphone, which might be annoying to anyone who's um, uh, listening from afar. Um, yeah, I think... Um, could you repeat the first question? I'm really sorry. sorry. The normalisation of neoliberal practices loss of experienced youth workers, reduction of open youth work. How do we look to create experienced supervisory through so community of practices for current part-time yes. youth workers yes. to support them to resist policy? Yeah, absolutely. I think this is what I'm talking about with the what feels like a really long-term loss of you know, infrastructure is probably the wrong word when we're talking about people, but um, 
the, the part-time youth workers I come across in my everyday life often now don't know a very experienced worker or the person that they know has been doing it a few years maybe. And we're talking about youth workers who are working with young people undergoing sexual exploitation, uh, self-harming, you know, suicidal thoughts, lots of really challenging work. Young people involved in gang issues. And these youth workers are doing amazing work. It's very skilled work. Um, and yeah, without that supervision, you know, it's emotionally hugely demanding work. Um, yeah, it's really difficult. Um, how do we do it? You know, I think we do need a range of training, university courses, and we need we need investment both in terms of money and um, sort of care for, for what these workers are doing. Absolutely. And this is one of the concerns, is that that is quite hard to replace once it's gone, because it would take that 10, 20 years. Those, work, those older, more experienced workers that I was lucky to learn from when I came into the practice, and some of whom annoyed me because, you know, I was new and they were stuck in their ways, you know, but like, I learned so much from them and from debating with them <laughs> and disagreeing with them. Um, yeah, it takes a long time, so yeah. And the second one was about, um, would you mention it again? Your talk has given us a clear pathway of how we have arrived at the current yeah. moment. What can you say about our way out of this? Yeah, yeah. I'm going to come on to that actually. So um, what I'm going to talk about now, unless anyone else has an issue now. So I'm going to mention a little bit about the study that I'm just in the process of beginning. Um, and then um, we'll also sort of finish with some tentative thoughts that I'd love to hear people's views on of, yeah, what are we meant to do? You know, what should we do about this situation? Um, so the study I'm, I just began with my colleague Louise Doherty a few months ago is called Rethinking Impact Evaluation in, and Accountability in Youth Work. So what was happening towards the end of my study is that rather than nece necessarily being asked to meet particular outcomes which were kind of um, quite crude almost, quite kind of, oh, you know, how many young people have got jobs? How many young people have got qualifications and certificates? There was at that time um, a growing move from within the youth sector, not necessarily kind of open youth work so much, but the wider youth sector, so, you know, um, various forms of social work and, and exciting activities and, you know, things with young people, programs with young people, to um, look at the impact of youth work. Um, and that came from many different places. Um, and so, you know, this was quite a new thing, so an interesting thing that was very controversial. And so this three-year study aims to investigate um, what I was calling the impact agenda, which is controversial apparently, <laughs> I later found out, but investigate whether and how this impact agenda is shaping everyday practice and the overall provision of open <laughs> youth work. So um, I wanted to um, understand more about what do young people feel about the ways in which youth work is increasingly recorded, both the kind of old ways that still remains, the kind of counting of outcomes and attendance and putting you on a database, but also the new ways of, you know, can you do a questionnaire at the beginning and end because we want to see the distance travelled and so on, which were meant to be, you know, intended to be a more nuanced and subtle way of accounting for the difference that youth services make. What do young people think of that? What do practitioners think of it? What do managers think of it? And how, how do policy influences sort of account for their views, their different views on youth impact? And that in involves, hopefully, we do want to sort of explore commonalities and differences with related fields of practice. So, you know, my teaching interest is often around schools and higher education, and I hear very similar debates going on there, albeit in very different practices, but also with youth work in other countries. And then part of the study, you know, overtly aims to think about approaches to evaluation and accountability that are congruent with youth work practice, so that kind of what can we do, um, which I would still argue is partly about resistance, and I'll come on to it. So I'm not going to say loads about this study, because we are early days, and also because I've talked for quite a long time already, but I'll just briefly outline what it involves, partly in case anyone who's listening may be interested in either taking part or thinking that they know someone who wants to take part, um, or just, you know, are interested in it in some way, um, just so you know a bit about it. But I'd like to mainly focus on sort of, can we, researchers, practitioners, 
thinkers, activists, can we do something? What would we even do if, we, if things changed, if we got a different political uh, leadership, if we got a different, you know, who knows what's going to happen even today? Has the government fallen yet today? I've not looked at the news for an hour or two. Um, <laughs> don't know what's going on. Um, Anyway, so uh, back to the nitty-gritty of youth work, our research plan is, is starting with a policy network analysis, a quite light touch look at um, how has this youth impact agenda thing, if that's what it is, come about, you know, wh how did that change come about, what's happened, um, so interviewing people, some people who are involved in that, by no means all, just a sort of small snapshot by attending lots of events, which I have been doing anyway around youth impact, um, and reading lots of policy materials um, in relation to youth impact, and, and youth impact's really the the biggest thing that's going on, I think, in the youth sector at the moment in terms of debate, alongside probably continued opposition to cuts, I'd say probably youth impacts the other, the thing that's happening, and it's kind of in some senses a positive thing, in some senses very problematic. Um, so research visits, focus groups, interviews in eight youth work settings. Um, Again, focusing on England, but there will be a small comparative element in the USA visiting four youth work settings there. And then more in-depth sort of um, ethnographically inspired work into youth work settings over a longer time involving some youth participatory research. And then um, kind of a lot of a focus on engaging with people. Uh, what do they think could be done? What can come out of this? How can we change things and make them better? Um, so briefly, I do want to sort of take this youth impact <laughs> agenda term and say what I mean by it. And I, have, I was challenged in my interviews with uh, policy influencers who I would have seen as, as involved in or supportive with the youth impact agenda, who felt that this term embodies already my, you know, my um, criti critique of, of youth impact. Uh, and they were saying, well, it's not a conspiracy. You know, we're not you know, behind closed doors trying to do something bad and that's not what I'd meant by it so I want to explain what I did mean by it which is that I do think there's a real broad consensus amongst most policy makers involved in the youth sector many influential organizations including funding bodies but also national youth sector organizations that the youth sector should be better at accounting for the impact it has on young people um, and I'm trying to couch this in in neutral language but Lucy and others might tell me if I can improve <laughs> this um, but um, I think that the youth impact agenda is um, broad consensus that the youth sector should identify outcomes, should think about what we're aiming to change as a result of what we do, that we should measure that change, we should find out and evidence what the difference is that we make in relation to these outcomes. So um, the difference between us doing a thing and not doing it. So often that means um, questionnaires, often validated tools at the beginning and end of an intervention and comparison with some kind of control group because we need to account for, you know, um, what would have happened anyway with these young people and also be better explaining what we do that helps us make that difference such as by using a theory of change so while I think some of the work that's going on in the impact arena is really interesting and creative um, including the work that's done at, at Ravi for example much of it's you know it is making youth workers think a bit more about what are we doing that makes the difference I do think fundamentally there is a real contradiction between measuring youth work uh, between measuring sorry and youth work um, so to go back to sort of the conceptualization of youth work as a distinctive practice that I put across. Youth work is person-centered informal education. It's based on dialogue and collective learning. So it's not really an intervention. The idea is that we work with, not on young people, and I'm sure many people in other social and education sectors would say, this, would say the same, but the kind of language of, you know, the intervention or the program um, rather than a practice or a service or something that's just there that we're all doing together is already feels uncomfortable to many youth workers from a more kind of open or informal setting. Youth work doesn't always have a specific focus or predefined outcome so sometimes predefined outcomes come from the open setting. Uh, young people together with youth workers identify something they want to work on and challenge um, so, you know, it might be, I was working with a group who were really unhappy about stop and search on the streets and wanted to challenge that. And then we did a film project that was about challenging it. I mean, who knows how we'd have measured the outcome of whether we 
there was less stop and search. I don't think there would have been. Does that mean it wasn't a useful political intervention? Probably more likely what the young people would have been measured on, you know, would be other things. Um, but actually, that was what they wanted as an outcome. They wanted the police to stop racist and classist and, you know, gendered stop and searches. Um, but youth work doesn't always have this kind of predefined outcome and much youth work is that kind of thing Anna Nina and Keyshawn were talking about where sometimes you're just sort of sitting there, it's kind of a place to be. Youth work doesn't always have a clear beginning and end. Um, in fact, it doesn't usually have a clear beginning and end. It's often open-ended, it's often long-term. And then the, what does come out of it is quite often... If you asked, you know, I was involved in youth work as a young person, and if you asked me then, and a few de years later, and a decade later, and now, I'd give different accounts of, of what it might have done for me. I mean, that's different from my account of it wouldn't really be highly valued in the, in the kind of what works frameworks anyway. It, it would, it's more about, you know, let's actually measure your kind of outcomes and so on uh, in a quantitative and validated sense. Youth work's not only about individuals as well, and it's, it sort of challenges, it actively challenges that individualisation. So while there might be some one-to-one -one work as part of youth work, there would be a big emphasis on peer relations, on neighbourhoods, on communities, and on social justice issues, which are much harder to sort of measure. Um, I will bring back in briefly this, the N-word, the neoliberalism word. Um, it's not that I think that people involved in promoting impact in the youth sector are coming from a neoliberal position. Usually that's not the case for many of them. Um, however, the impact agenda does go along with quite a lot of... Um, neoliberal ways of doing things and the threat to open grassroots approaches to youth work can't be explained by austerity alone it can it is also enabled by certain kind of ways of valuing things if we have to have certain measures to enable us to value things then you know the things that are hardest to value the things that are hardest to measure those informal practices are going to be the first ones to go um, so there have been three different phases, I would suggest, sort of from uh, informal approaches to evaluation to the counting and comparison of outputs and outcomes that I found in my first research to now um, an impact agenda that's in some ways more nuanced and in some ways not, but which often gets converted into social return on investment to money, monetary values to social value. I'm writing a, a journal article at the moment with Ian Medimpsey, who's at Birmingham University, and he writes... Um, beautifully about uh, that we're in a phase now of late neoliberalism which and he says there's this finance capital imaginary which has a real kind of hold on policy making at this time in, in the youth sector and beyond and this imaginary uses the metaphors and the process of, it, of investment so it's not just market processes now it's, social, it's actual investment um, processes so that kind of how much are you going to get back and this is exemplified in uh, what Ian and I are writing about the National Citizen Service and how that, um, which is a very you know, structured summer programme for young people, that now receives 95% of central government spending on youth services. And most of that, the rationale for that is because it was a manifesto commitment of the Conservative Party. It's not necessarily directly that it's because of how it's valued but the NCS is then feeding back into policy by trialing out various um, various sort of social investment uh, methods of evaluation so they claim these returns on investment they claim up to eight pounds for every one pound spent the same data they claim two pounds for every one pound spent or 70p for every one pound spent because it just depends how you juggle the figures and what methodologies you use but, and they rely on sort of some of these larger claims rely on very highly contested methodologies even within the impact world itself um, and I'm happy to talk about this all day but I, I won't I do just want to finish with some thoughts on what should be done so you know I'd, um, <laughs> come back to me on what we find from our study and I'll have got a bit further with it but I do want to just you know I, I get asked even being early in this research project well you know people come and say well I, I work for youth organization we have to get these figures that's what our funders want that's what policymakers want what are we meant to do? How can we do this better? And I think it's a really good question. It's a complicated question. So, you know, I think there's some things that are kind of principles um, 
that we could start from, including the importance of dialogue, um, thinking about and sharing approaches to evaluation that are compatible with youth work. I think there are some methods that already just seem to be more coherent with youth work, um, congruent with youth work, sorry, including narrative methods, storytelling, um, the Indefensive Youth Work group that I mentioned before does kind of collective approaches to storytelling, collective and explicitly political and critical approaches to storytelling about practice. And there are other forms such as the um, transformative evaluation that's been done in a recent um, international study, including Sue Cooper and John Ord at uh, Marjon um, University in Plymouth. But, um, you know, qualitative methods such as interviewing, uh, um, ethnographic approaches have been used for a long time in youth work, but not so much now. Um, youth participatory research as well. So these are established research methods, but in the youth sector at the moment, they're not seen as very kind of relevant to uh, evidencing the impact of youth work in general. Um, I think it's really important, going back to part-time youth workers and volunteers who make up the majority of who youth workers are, to go back to valuing their perspectives and also, of course, valuing the perspectives of young people. And I've been in meetings where managers have sometimes said, well, you know, my part-timers really don't want to do this measuring and the young people don't really want to do it and we kind of have to make them. And I think, well, you know, if these people aren't wanting to do it, let's tune into why that is. And if people are being critical or resistant or obstructive, usually there's going to be a reason and, and it's going to have some kind of good sense behind it. Let's find out what that's about and take it seriously rather than just finding it annoying. Um, not that those managers are necessarily doing that, but, you know, I think it's important to take it seriously. Thinking beyond outcomes, so maybe outcomes that aren't the only way to value work. Um, you know, we could look at it in a rights framework, in a young people's rights framework. The um, Convention on the Rights of the Child involves the right to play and leisure, the right to social and political life. And do young people have a right to youth work? Um, does youth work help them to access their rights? We can think about um, different methods of accountability, which I'll come on to in a moment. We can think about the value of youth work for groups, communities, social justice objectives. And I'm really interested in what conditions enable high quality youth work. So there's been a move recently amongst um, supporters of youth impact to rather than just think about let's measure the impact of youth work, um, also think about how do we... Um, how do we measure the quality of the work, not just the impact of the work? And I think youth work quality is really important, but do we need to measure that? You know, I'd rather think about what are the conditions under which this youth work is likely to be high quality. So if we think about, sort of, to use that word grassroots again, which I seem to like, what might grassroots accountability look like? Under what conditions is high quality youth work most likely to thrive? And this is where, you know, the solution is, it does need to be back to political debate, really, because it, we can't create a, um, a form of evaluation that's going to square this circle. We need to change the overall political context. And for youth work, that's going to mean long-term sustainable funding, long-term sustainable jobs. You know, I'm saying very obvious idealistic things, but it's essential. Attractive, supportive volunteer opportunities, as little bureaucracy as possible, reflective critical evaluation, training and education at all levels, including that supervision um, that our friend from Sunderland brought up. Good communication about the value of youth work. So yes, I do think we need to be good at communicating what we do, but including the subtleties and the nuances within that. And we do need this underpinned by systemic change. Um, so ending things like the payment by results culture, changing who makes policy. We spoke to um, somebody in, in Scotland who... Um, I'd be interested in, I don't know if our, our um, colleague from the Highlands um, has a different view on this, but in Scotland, um, the officer who spoke to us from YouthLink, he said that um, most politicians in Scotland support youth work because they were involved in it when they were young. And I don't want to simplify that to class, but, you know, are there more working class people involved in politics in Scotland? Our politicians don't know what youth work is. So we have David Cameron who came in and let youth work disappear under his premiership while, in, while beginning this new thing called the National Citizen Service because he wanted young people to have the opportunities he had at Eton. You know, it, it's like dump this thing that's been grown up in communities over time and, and set up a new thing that's like a public school thing. 
<laughs> anyway, um, so um, it's kind of a paradox and it's kind of impossible. So, you know, I, I, I really love this quote from Judith Butler about the paradox and the impossibility. If I have any agency, it's opened up by the fact that I'm constituted by a social world I never chose. That my agency is riven with paradox does not mean it's impossible. It means only that paradox is the condition of its possibility. And while it's a bit of a, you know, it's a very complex thought that we could have had the whole hour and a half just speaking about this. For me, it's really useful to remember that we are constituted by a social world that we didn't choose. We are to do things in this world, we are, th this is a paradox, but it doesn't mean that we can't change things, that we can't do anything. But how do we get from here to there? Um, no idea, you know, we could draw on those ideas of everyday resistance, um, such as mentioned by the youth workers in my previous study, you know, pointing out the contradictions and limitations inherent in this taken for granted world that we're living in, um, speaking up against onerous and inappropriate systems. I do think there's a need to work collectively as well to resist, rebel and revolt um, and alternatives as well to show that there are alternatives including in the evaluation and accountability world which I know some people are doing and working on and I'd be interested in, in um, contributing to that. So um, just to finish by you know saying that um, I think it is really important to evaluate youth work in a way that values it, that I think we need really grassroots bottom-up approaches to accountability and to evaluation. Um, and to suggest that, you know, there is a possibility of another world. There is, this isn't the only thing that's possible. And some of that possibility is quite visible at the moment. Um, there might be new investment in youth work if we have a different government, there might be a chance for the tide to turn and we need to stay critical and not romanticise these things but it's possible. And what is the role for critical research? Can we be both critical but also useful in terms of informing what should a worker do when they're stuck in this impossible paradox? So thank you for listening. <laughs> So, um, because we've got so many questions coming in already, thick and fast from around the globe, we will come uh, in the room if you ask questions, if you could hold the microphones because they're essential to people around the world. Thank you. So, Rebecca. Okay, so, um, Liz, the group of funds will give you a round of applause. Ah. Oh. And the innovation. Yes. And Sidney uh, Church, so he's got two, two questions. Um, you know I can't do two at once. I've <laughs> noticed that before. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> do you think the possibility to meet in the middle mm. youth organisations evaluating and producing meaningful evidence for them and funders, or do you think resistance through retracting from evaluation is the only way? Do you think I need to stand up because I've sat down now? Uh, no, I, don't. I think it's. Can okay. they still see me? I think it's not a problem. It's just a, it's a microphone. Isn't it? Yeah, got the microphone. Um, I think it's really important to resist. There is always a move to kind of compromise and meet in the middle and we can do this and that. And for me, um, you know, I think policy has changed in progressive directions through people resisting and through political action and solidarity, some of which comes from the workplace, some of which comes from young people, some of which comes from unexpected areas. Um, and I... I do think there's a, there's a possibility of um, producing meaningful evidence that's meaningful to, to young people, to youth workers and to policy makers, but only if what policy makers require changes and is challenged. So yes, I think we need, I think there's a possibility, but to get to that possibility, I think resistance is important. You know, I've started, work, I've talking, started talking to people who work in policy and a little bit, um, and I think there is, there is a view from many people who are really committed to the youth impact agenda for good reasons, because they want youth work to be funded, so they want to help the sector, you know, translate their, their achievements in this <coughs> new way. And sometimes people are saying, you know, can't you just all agree to, to have a, a shared narrative? That's one of the terms at the moment, a shared narrative. And I think, yes, there's a lot we share, but things change through contestation and actually fundamental to the youth work method is, is contestation so I, will, I do want to hold on to that and I hope to yeah, persuade people involved in policy that that's a valuable thing 
I mean, in the youth, the youth impact debates at the moment, one of the things, there's a, there's a Centre for Youth Impact, which is a very key organisation in, in our world in youth work. Um, and one thing they have done really well is see their role as not to impose uh, a particular version of impact on the youth sector, it's not just youth work, but to hold lots of opportunities for debates and contestation. I mean, I think, you know, I th I'd like to see them challenge more, but that's, that's differences, isn't it? Um, but um, they do at least provide quite a lot of opportunities for debate, which is really <coughs> good. Well, certainly the second question is, I've been thinking that evaluation and supervision could be integrated with each other if there was more of an emphasis on learning and support in the evaluation yeah. process. Yeah. Do you think that might work or do you think that neoliberal policies would still confine learning within unhelpful parameters? Yeah. I think that's exactly what we need to do, that our evaluation needs to inform what we do and be part of our learning. They need to go together. The storytelling approach that we use in independent youth work is by no means perfect. I wouldn't say it's the only thing that should happen, but um, we go and do workshops with people and it started as a professional development and being able to communicate our work uh, thing and then some services and organisations are using it as evaluation. But it's evaluation through which the young people or the youth workers or both are involved and the facilitators are, are really learning while also kind of communicating the work while also reflecting critically on it. But yeah, I think we would, that, that's going to be hard to, um, it's going to be hard to, to make kind of many policymakers find that a meaningful means of evaluation under the current neoliberal context. Mm -hmm. Can I read another question? Yeah. A different person. Yeah. Um, this is uh, Christine Smith, who says, excellent, Tanya, very thought-provoking on many levels. What would your advice to LGA be, currently debating the development of a modern outcome I really think that we need to think about what I was suggesting about the what are the conditions for high quality youth work so I'd rather it wasn't an outcomes framework you know I'd rather it was a something else a quality framework or something that was about what could quality youth work look like and what do we need to aim for in order to make this happen um, I think if we are going to think about outcomes, then we, we also need to think beyond the kind of individualised outcomes. So some of the most popular outcomes that are measured in youth work are things like confidence, self-efficacy, self-esteem, leadership skills, these kind of things. Um, and what doesn't tend to be measured very much is, is kind of more social justice, social change objectives, things, community and group change. So. For people who are really interested in outcomes, I would really like to see more work. There is some work done on it, but I'd like to see more work on kind of a more um, youth work relevant approaches to outcomes that are not just individualised kind of coping with the world, however bad the world is. Let's, you know, resilience is another one, isn't it? It's, it's all about we need our young people to kind of manage despite the horrible situations they're in. And we do want them to manage. We do want them to be okay. But we need to challenge these horrible situations fundamentally. How can we? How can we? Can we have outcomes around that? And so, you know, I'd, I'd like to see work around that um, from the LDA. And yeah. Questions from inside the Or comments. It doesn't have yeah, to be questions. Just, just email. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask on the, where I got a bit confused? Because um, you mentioned theory of change on one of your slides, oh, yeah. and so that would kind of say to me that something has to change, yeah. you know, so what's the theory behind, and then if you've identified what the change has to be, yeah. is that not the outcome that, that you're aiming for, yeah. so it is, that is an outcomes framework, yeah. and then I felt, it, it felt a bit like we were kind of, talking about social control, which is obviously something that we've always said youth work is never about. So I'm just a bit confused by it. I tried to have a quick two seconds yeah. <laughs> earlier about it, but it worries me, you know, and the other thing about that is, is um, in terms of what's happening at the moment around um, the publicity, around um, county lines and, yeah. you know, the gang stuff and the knives and all of that in London, 
and we've always had to work with young people that are at their lived experiences about those things but actually it does feel like it's exploded recently in terms of awareness yeah. and that youth work and youth provision yeah. is kind of side by side in that conversation and then if I start to think of the theory of change I'm kind of thinking oh well what does that look like then how many kids have you know, walked away from gangs or what, I don't know, but it just yeah. feels a bit uncomfortable. And, yeah, absolutely. You know, at the moment, all of the discussion around it, that's all. So it's not yeah. even a question, it's more of a, like, it's just making me think if, we're, if we are really clear about that. Yeah. I agree. Mm. Don't say anything about any theory of change or anything else. <laughs> well, I guess... Um, from a Centre for Youth Impact mm. perspective, um, I think um, you used the word meaningful, mm. and um, that's up front and centre, mm. kind of in, in the mission of the centre. Um, and it, a lot of it is about um, creating a way that we look at our work that isn't that doesn't take from um, other kind of sciences and things. It's, it's recreating something that works for us. Yeah. Um, because we want to do it, because yeah. we want to know, we, we do want to know about quality. Yeah. It's about improve as well as prove and that kind of thing. Um, but we need to do it in a way that fits with us um, and our practice. And so it's about creating that because it hasn't been there before. Um, so how do we, we can draw from similar practices, but, but actually this is about our practice. And so a lot of the work of the centre is about people having agency and knowing and expressing what they're doing in a theory of change and then saying, okay, we want to know this about it. And so we might measure it in a variety of ways, not just a kind of tool like this. And, and this is why. So they, they have more agency and can um, tell funders how they want to measure it. And that does happen. It absolutely does happen. We do that all the time in practice. Um, and more of that is what the sense of youth impact, I think, is probably a big driver. Do you think um, the Centre for Youth Impact has changed it in that relation over time? And do you, th do you think that, I mean, I'm not asking you to speak for them, but, you know, I've seen a change where it, it felt like it started off actually borrowing from other um, fields and trying to suggest that we needed to measure things and that there were, was a hierarchy of evidence and is now trying to avoid saying there's a hierarchy of what counts as evidence. And trying to be a bit more open about it. So, you know, I feel like there's been a bit of a, a change. I mean, you don't need to answer, but, you know, it's, it feels to me like contestation has been really helpful in that process. But maybe if you're on the receiving end of it, it doesn't feel helpful at all. Yeah, I, I can answer. Yeah. Because um, I'm a trustee for them. But yeah. also, the way it started out was at Brave in our practice, we were like, oh, we want to get hold of this mm. and we want to see how we can do it for ourselves and yeah. grappling with it and we formed groups of similar organisations and, and it was peer learning, mm. you know, that's how we formed networks and now there are networks all over the country that are doing the yeah. same thing and um, so actually I, I don't think it ever was that, if mm. that was the impression of yeah. it, I don't think it was the right impression and yeah. um, I think they're very open to drawing from yeah. other practices yeah. um, because in some contexts we might need some of that stuff but it isn't everything yeah. um, and kind of those methods you're talking about, um, Kaz and I, Kaz Stewart, my colleague, Tracy's yeah. colleague, um, we wrote about that too, yeah. about creative yeah. methods that are embedded in practice and not done too. And so, yeah, it, I think yeah. that has been about a while. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really difficult. I mean, um, the, you know, I'm not speaking against the censor. I, I <laughs> you know, go along to loads of the stuff they do and I'm... I think, as they say, there's lots of strengths to what the Centre for Youth Impact does, and I, I'm not, I don't particularly think that's where the problem is. I think it's the, the neoliberal framework that we're in, and then, you know, what's that? Who's responsible for that? It's amorphous. We don't know. As I, as I said, I don't think the people who support the youth impact agenda, if there is such a thing, are kind of coming from a neoliberal position. I know you're not, and I know other people at the centre are not either. Um, so that's not sort of who, that's not the kind of target of the critique, really. Um, but unfortunately, it's very difficult to do those, you know, while, while it's, 
there's a lot of, well, there's different approaches and, you know, you can have the, these tools and you can have other things. But at the moment, it is the tools, it is the measuring, it is the comparisons that are valued. It is the National Citizen Service that's getting 95% of government funding. That's by no means, you know, the centrifuge impact sport whatsoever at all. Um, so it's those kind of, those kind of overarching, that's why I think there needs to be more fundamental change and that's... It's very early thoughts, but that's my thought. It's not kind of get, meant to be getting at the centre at all. And that's a big part yeah. of the, the YIF um, yeah. evaluation. Yeah. They are looking at the conditions as well and evaluating well, the conditions. Well, it's interesting. Isn't it? I mean, again, the, yeah, I mean, maybe we, it gets too parochial if we get into too much detail about this, but, um, but yeah, even, you know, to, to have to then measure those conditions. And I'm not against numbers. I think numbers are really useful. Numbers have played a role in lots of social justice movements and are really important. But to reduce quality indicators to, to indicators to numbers, I'm not saying it's always bad, but I don't know if that is about the conditions for quality youth work practice. It, it could be. I'm not altogether against it, I but... We're just measuring yeah, okay. through numbers. Okay. So that's really important. Yeah. It has that mixed method. Yeah. Yeah. Well. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's too long a discussion to have here, and I do know what you're referring to, and I, I agree there's lots of good things about it. Yeah. Joe, you might need to get your mic. I'm not sure whether it's a question or a comment, uh, William, but it's probably William. Oh, thank you. Um, I guess one of my thoughts in relation to what, what can we do, what can be done, and concerns is whether. Mm -hmm the neoliberalisation in education, that young people are actually losing the tools to do critical thinking yeah. and having them taken away, such that they come to, and we're all guilty of it, use terms like resilience mm -hmm. and in uncritical ways mm -hmm. and no longer be able to put a stand out mm -hmm. in order to, to then resist yeah. and it becomes sort of absorbed yeah. from an early age and whether that is another way in which you can think about what you do. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And so anything that's like even saying, oh, we'll do young person-centred methods or young people-led methods of evaluation, sometimes we inscribe those things because young people themselves have grown up in that world, so they might think, well, you know, and, and historically in, in terms of youth work, often if we ask young people what, um, what why do you, you know, what do you think is the benefit of youth work? They'll often say it keeps us off the streets. And I believe young people should occupy this. You know, they should be on the streets. They should be visible. They should be on the streets. So it's a, it's a longer conversation. Um, yeah. I've got a, a related question. Because mm. I was thinking as you were talking about the resistance and the revolting and all that kind of thing. Whether, um, and at the same time, the people who have got lots of experience of youth work mm. kind of being pushed out of the system, whether that resistance is decreasing yeah. um, as these kinds of processes just become normalised yeah. and if the people that have been resisting are, are not around as much yeah. new people are coming in for whom this system is yeah. you know, what they're used to whether, whether yeah. you're optimistic about that resistance continuing Yeah, yeah. yeah that's something that interests me you know, I've read quite a few articles that about you know teachers and higher education workers who the the sort of newer people coming in don't have this tradition of resistance and aren't as critical about things because the kind of performative culture we haven't really talked about performativity but that that kind of um, you know we've got to succeed we've got to be the enterprising individual who's always improving it, it kind of has become so normalised it seeps into our everyday ways of living. Yeah, I am really ho hopeful about young people, like young people at the moment, you know, I mean, to generalise massively, are resisting in amazing ways about loads of stuff to do with, you know, lots of things, gender, race. Yeah, I mean, the fact that gender, race, class and many other kind of axes of identity or axes is a stupid word, but, you know, identity issues it is it's really vibrant at the moment amongst young people and young youth workers and young academics and young teachers. So, yeah, things ebb and flow, don't they? And I, yeah, yeah, we can see resistance in different places. But there is, yeah, I think that relates to your, your question about the normalisation of certain concepts and keeping, not taking our, even our own, our own first answers to something. We need to then 
unpick them and think about them and well resilience but what's the problem with resilience or you know yeah mm. Rebecca, um, Christine sort of the comment here I'm thinking Bourdieu's analysis of symbolic violence is useful when we're thinking about outcomes and that our focus needs to be on the harm that institutions produce ways of working that can produce silences or mm. strategies for change mm. Yeah, I think so. And I think that's why I do, because I am sort of conscious of having a bit of a debate with Lucy here, or, you know, I have these debates a few times, and, you know, I really want to work with rather than against people where we share a lot of, a lot of the thoughts, but, and I, and I, you know, I really, I'm interested, though, in those kind of, those feelings, those emotional, those kind of instincts that not all but some youth workers, not all but some young people have about this impacting. And I just do think that's meaningful. And so I do want to make it visual, not kind of let's... And, I, and as I said, I think the centre really does provide space for debate, so isn't trying to shut it down. But, but yeah, that's sort of what I'm interested in is let's... Let's think about these things. Let's think about these discomforts and these if people feel a violence is being done, symbolic or, or otherwise. You know, wh what's that about? Let's dig into that and try and understand it. Yeah. That's really important. I'm not an academic, so you two are talking sometimes in a language that I'm having to catch up in my brain. And I think as a youth worker, for me, what I'm really interested in is, is who's saying what yeah. to the policy makers and yeah. how are they representing youth work. So actually this debate is really, really important. Yeah. And I know that, you know, I mentioned it earlier, it, you know, people have been invited down to Parliament quite recently to describe youth work and yeah. sell it and all of that and there's big concerns. And I'm, I'm sat up here worried that I'm not down there telling them what it's like because, you know, it's, it's how I view youth work is what they should be trying to you know, give back to communities, if you like, for communities to, to be able to take control again and that. Do you know what I mean? So it's really important that, you know, if you've got, if, if they're listening to your voice, that it's the voice that I, I want you to be saying, or you, or who. So, so for me, there is some value, I think, in maybe if we're being forced down a road of having to describe it in order to get, because I'm a real believer in, in a statutory duty to fund this stuff. I, yes. I really believe in that, never having worked in the statutory sector, I still believe it's a statutory duty to offer communities this. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And so I do want to influence it somehow. So it, this is all very important. I've never heard of this impact thing that you're yeah. debating. I'm going to go Google it. Yeah. Um, and try and work it out, but it is. In, it, this is really important, especially as things are closing down. You know, Barton Road. Even in Lancaster, you've got Barton Road. You know, not doing what it used to do, but you've got the Girls and Boys Club, the, the traditional one, and Dallas Road still vibrant. That's voluntary sector. You know, and we're all we're all still trying to survive in some ways, and uh, and you know, those policymakers are listening to those that have managed to get through those policy doors and. Yeah. It is important, I suppose, that we do have some kind of collective strength yeah. in terms of what we're saying. Yeah. I think that absolutely hits the nail on the head about articulating what, what yeah. it is. Because mm. if people don't get it, well, we can't be articulating it. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's what it is, what it does, the impact it has, all of it. Yeah. And, and it, yeah, so and I think that's absolutely the essence of the argument that we're just coming out from different kind of angles. Yes, yeah. we, we do want to articulate it. And yeah, we want to do it well, and so it, me, it does represent you and yeah. your youth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It just feels so deficit at the minute. Come and talk to us because we've got all these young people involved in all this crisis. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a rallying cry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, more online. Yes, this is John, also from the Highland. He says, great presentation and some food for thought. And this is in relation to your youth link comment. One of the reasons I moved from England to Scotland to practice is youth work still exists. 
at a policy level, it has backing from government and education of Scotland. Perhaps CLD regs being embedded into legislation has been a good thing and maybe part of saving a statutory services up here rather than the decimation I have witnessed and been part of in England. The Scottish Government embraces youth work as a distinct practice. This year, the Scottish Government's themed year is the Year of Young People. There's it all. And he said, is it possible to get a copy of your presentation? Yeah. <laughs> of course. No, that's really interesting to hear. Yeah. And uh, just to say that the presentation, well, this, this film of the presentation uh, will actually be online on the department's website within the next few weeks. So slides and and the live live presentation. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? <laughs> Perfect <laughs> timing. Time your break because yeah. we've been going for uh, an hour and a half and it's just flown by. So, um, so I think a, a few things to say. But first of all, thank you again to Tanya. Thank you to an amazing audience from all over the place. It's been absolutely fantastic. I think it's the most interactive in terms of distance participants we've ever had. Yay, youth workers! <laughs> so that shows how, in, how important the topic is and how engaging your presentation is. So thank you to everybody who's um, joined online. And uh, I hope you will join some of our other seminars um, because we live stream all of our seminars actually so please check out our department web pages just another thing to say is that it, um, I didn't say much about what the Centre for Social Justice and Wellbeing does but actually our main work apart from running seminars and doing research in the area of social justice is that we've got a new MA program in education and social justice and a PhD program in education and social justice both of which run online and we welcome applications from interested parties and we do indeed have some uh, students in the room so if anybody's interested again just check out our web pages and get in touch as you probably notice we're a very friendly bunch mm -hmm. so um, and for people that are in the room if anybody wants to we're going to the White Cross for food and a drink if anybody wants to join you are very welcome to we'll sort out transport down there and just thank you again it's been absolutely fabulous and oh. we really appreciate you thanks so much for the invite thank you, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.